welcome to another uh, live streaming chat. Today I'm going to be talking with Ian Finelli, the amazing um, artist and urban sketcher, um, and uh, he uh, teaches travel workshops and online workshops, and soon to be a book author, and we're really excited about that. We'll tell you more about that. Hi, Ian. Hi, Brenda. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I would say it's lovely to see you, but I can't see any of you. No, <laughs> but, but they're me, there. An imaginary wave, everyone. Give me an imaginary wave. Thanks there for joining me. Thank you. So, so exciting. So today we're going to talk about Urban Sketching Sunflower Edition. So you are now the sunflower expert, having <laughs> painted them so many times recently. <laughs> so uh, what are you going to show us today, Ian? Okay, well, I've been doing some sunflowers be because, um, as, as, as we all know, the, kind of the world's closed down, the world's on hold for a little bit. So it's kind of tricky to, to get anywhere at the moment. So I've been kind of scratching around looking for things to do. I know it's much more positive than that. And I've decided to kind of have a go at sunflowers, which is basically urban sketching in a kind of more abstract way and on a more kind of micro a micro level as well it's exactly the same as what i normally do but instead of windows i've got petals and instead of doorways i've got leaves but it's still the same kind of thing and it's it's been it's been great fun so we're gonna have a little look at some of them um during the live stream super okay so let's have a look at some of your art i'm just going to take a moment uh, to admit another person to this call and then i will share the screen and we'll look at your beautiful um watercolor uh, sunflowers so ian what's the big difference in in your mind like what is the the main difference that you see with drawing you know an organic um mm -hmm. subject like a flora or fauna and mm -hmm. um the the landscapes with the buildings and so on that you usually do yeah i mean in, in some ways brenda there's, there's lots of differences i mean the differences really are, are the fact that the space in front of you is is completely different in terms of when i draw a sunflower and this is a kind of black and white sketch that i did in preparation for the watercolor one everything's really close to you so as you turn your head you can see angles a lot more so than you can see them when you're working on a kind of urban cityscape where, where everything in front of you is maybe 10 15 20 30 meters away so it's a much more kind of fixed point if you're doing like a cityscape but if you're doing like um, a still life from direct observation when you kind of move around you can you can change the angle so you can investigate it a lot more you know you can literally lift up some of the petals and have a little poke around and see what's going on underneath and i was doing that all the time which is why some of the petals kept falling off because i was actually physically not manhandling it but i was actually shaping it and manipulating it as i'm kind of working on it, just to kind of really investigate what's going on and of course you can't do that with a doorway or a chimney or a satellite dish well, if you did, you'd have to go up a ladder and you get shouted at. So you can't physically manipulate the thing in front of you. But with a still life, you can. And also, it's much more kind of organic as well. You know, things are kind of shifting and moving. And there's an awful lot of real visual ambiguity going on. You know, it's a real kind of mass of kind of shapes and, and tones and patterns and things. And I quite like that because when you're doing a, city, a cityscape, everything's quite specific. You know, a window is a window and a door is a door cobbles are cobbles and, and things and you can't really turn them into anything other than what they are otherwise it's going to start looking a bit weird but mm. with, a, with a sunflower and with flowers i suppose in general there's a lot of ambiguity going on which i think can be a real positive thing and yeah. you kind of just lose yourself in it completely which right. which is great great fun yeah yeah so what are we looking at here well, this is this is a, a kind of a, a, a preparation sketch that, that I did. So before I did the sunflower, um, I wanted to kind of work out all the tonal values and, and basically the composition. So how these kind of three three sunflowers fitted on the page. So you've got the big kind of dominant one at the top and then the other two are kind of falling asleep. And, and so it's kind of working out the basic structure of them exactly the same way as I would do if I was doing a, a cityscape, you know, just kind of working out the big shapes. Um, and then I kind of went in with the brush pens using about four or five different toned brush pens and then started picking up all the kind of detail and the fine line work. So it was almost like the same creative journey that I would do if I was working on location, um, mm -hmm. you know, step by step. Right. And so this, what we're seeing here is with your amazing magical Tombow pens. 
Tombow brush pens uh, is, and some fine liners. Yeah, yeah. So it's just there's no there's no paint, there's no colour on this at all. It's just brush pen initially, and then and then fine liner. And it took that took about <laughs> minutes, maybe forty five minutes. And it's a bit it's a bit rough around the edges, but I kind of like that. I like the energy. I like the you know the, the kind of slightly unfinished quality to it. And 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 like I suppose like any cityscape brander, the more you start investing in 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 a subject you know, the more you start imagining what's going on. So you start looking at these as characters and you start imagining that, you know, they've got slightly different personalities. And, and you know, I always think that the one at the top is a lot more confident than the other two. The other two kind of turn their head away as if they don't look at me. You know, I'm a bit shy. I don't want to be drawn today by you. <laughs> so they've, they've turned around. And it's, yeah, it's what's magical about any kind of visual thing, isn't it? You know, when you're being creative, you can just invest your own, your own imagination. Yeah. Okay, so this is the fit. This is you went from that black and white to yeah. this color. Yeah. Can I just make sure everybody's aware that, that these are two completely different pictures? So that the, the colored one is not just the first one colored in, it's a totally different picture started all over again. But it is actually the same, the same three flowers. And, and what, what I think is really interesting looking at them now, the second one, which we're looking at on the screen, was done probably about two hours later. And so they're kind of like two hours nearer towards dying. I mean, they were in water, but for some reason they just weren't happy. I think it was my studio. I think it was the fact that I was like picking bits off them all the time. So they, they, they look like they're collapsing even more, especially the one on the bottom right. He's really had enough by now. So the first one, the black and white one, was just enabling me to kind of work out the composition and the structure and where things were going to fit on the page. And then I kind of did it all over again from the beginning. But this time, I went in with the colour before I put the tone work on. So the outline went on, and then the colour went on, and then the tone work, and then the detail. So that was the kind of creative process that, that I went through. Right. And um, so um, I know that you're going to talk about uh, having a limited palette. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for these workshops. So what, what are the colours that you use? Um, okay. Okay. Do you know what we should do, Brenda, to make this interactive? We should put it out as a quiz question. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. And, and people can try, try and guess. Guess. There's only, there's only three colours in this. There's only three. I mean, there's, there's the Tombow brush pens as well. So there, there is grey. There's lots of grey tone work with the pen. But that, that doesn't count. But there's only actually three colours that I've used. Okay. And let, let's see if people can... Would like to just to pop in now and see if they can they can get just to prove people are actually listening at the moment because they might have all switched off they might, they might be all watching the telly by now <laughs> oh, all right we've got some guesses coming in oh lots of people are guessing um oh, can you hear the blinging i can i can i thought that was people switching off and putting the news on no 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 okay. but they are one person said your voice is very soft we need to get you to speak a bit louder. Okay. Okay, okay so um, we've got some questions, we've got some answers here. Yeah. And uh, let's see. So Mike is guessing uh, burnt sienna and cobalt blue, just and I'll tell okay. you who else. Okay. And, um, and. Mike's, Mike's got one right, but I won't yes. say which one. Mike's got one right so far. And Eileen is saying burnt sienna, lemon yellow, and cobalt blue. And uh, Eileen, well, Liz is saying ultramarine blue. Oh, that happened too fast. <laughs> They're popping in now. Okay. okay well, I'll two, just... two of the colors are right so far, but nobody's got both of them. One person's got one, another person's got another one. Okay. So a uh, flower sun is saying ultramarine blue, yellow ochre, and orange, and burnt sienna. And okay, uh, two, MK two Buke. Uh, yeah. is not answering that question, different question. Nan, Nadi is saying burnt sienna, ultramarine blue, and Naples yellow. Wow, two rights. And Naraj is saying burnt sienna, ultramarine, yellow ochre. All, and, almost, almost. And Anne is saying Quinn gold and cobalt. Yeah. And Jan Potter is saying um, blue, blue, yellow ochre, and burnt umber. Okay. 
And mm -hmm. Liz Vargas is saying ultramarine blue and ochre. Oh my gosh, I can't keep up with them all. They're all, everyone's jumping in. I love it. Um, so who, who am I looking at here? Somebody is saying, um, Eileen is saying burnt sienna, lemon yellow, and cobalt blue. Um, okay, so I think that, oh, Rick Den Braber is saying burnt sienna, fallow blue. And Tatiana is saying ultramarine, orange, and sienna. Okay. Uh, uh, and that's everyone. Quite a few people have almost got it. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's ultramarine blue first. That went on first, ultramarine. Then burnt sienna. And then, it's, and then it's Indian, it's Indian yellow, which is a bit like, it's a bit like Windsor yellow deep or cadmium yellow deep, but not quite as strong. It's a bit more subtle. So it's, it's Indian yellow and I can, I can show them in my, in my palette in, in a moment. So the, the color journey for this is quite specific because, because I wanted to really limit the palettes because I think the danger is you can just kind of chuck the whole kitchen sink out and use every color that you've got. Yeah. And it all starts getting a little bit over, overworked and perhaps a bit over complicated. So because the actual subject was quite, um, was quite complex in terms of all the petals and all the shapes and all the patterns and all the negative space that's coming through, I thought it would be more challenging just to really limit the colours. Um, and I know that ultramarine and burnt sienna are, are great colours, almost like default colours for, for creating lots of different tones and you know, rain, ranges of, of washes that you can create from that. And then obviously I had to introduce the Indian yellow as well because well because the petals are yellow. So I had to have some kind of compliment. You gotta have some yellow in there. Yeah, but I didn't put any green in though. Didn't put any green in. Right. And and Indian yellow and ultramarine doesn't really don't really create a great a great kind of green. I'm not quite sure what they create, but it's not really greeny. But I'm I'm quite happy about that. I didn't really kind of want the green in this one because it was going to be a bit much, a bit too much, you know, having blue, green, yellow, brown, a kind of ready brown. It was just gonna look a bit too too much too much variety going on so i kind of very much limited limited it by not introducing green so it was a great it was a great technical exercise just to very much limit your palettes and just to see what you can squeeze out because within that you have to really challenge yourself you know to get as many different varieties as you can so if you, if you look at the center the centerpiece which is predominantly below the ultramarine blue the big flower at the top, the big guy that's, you know, really up for it and really excited and happy to be there. He's got like an ultramarine wash on, but he's got a watery wash and he's got a very kind of, a kind of mid blue wash. And then there's a bit of um, burnt sienna kicking off as well. And then the two of them at the bottom have just mixed together to give like a really dark, intense tone. So within that sphere, you know, I'm, I'm trying to create as much variety as possible. And I've, I've kind of applied the same the same idea you know throughout the picture really yeah okay i have a couple of questions for you here about color uh from sandy she's asking does do you find a uh, cubert orange and burnt sienna are fully interchangeable or would you use one for different applications sorry what, what were the colors again what were they um q which i think is the quin quin burnt orange and um, burnt okay. sienna okay I think I've never used the first one. I don't think I've ever used it. So I can't, I can't really comment. I mean, I, I, I use a lot of different colors. I mean, I, in my palettes, um, I've got, um, in fact, Brenda, do you want to pop the screen back onto me? Because I can just show, I can, I can explain my, my range of colors here. So this is, this is the palettes that I was using for yeah. the sunflowers. But obviously I've only used three of them. But I've got, I've got four of these. And in these four palettes, I've got a couple of colors which occur all the time. I've always got black and I've always got white. And I've always got, I think, ultramarine blue. I think they're in all of them. And then things like a red, a deep red and Indian yellow pop up in most of them as well. So I've probably got about 30 different colors within this range. But I know there's other colors that are available which I've never really tried. Yeah. And I think the reason being, I don't want to make things too complicated for myself. Yeah. Because when I go out, I have a lot of stuff. I have a lot of brush pens, a lot of fine liners. I have a lot of colors. So I don't really want to experiment when I'm running workshops. I kind of experiment when I'm by myself. Yeah. But when I'm kind of running things, I need to know exactly what I'm going to be able to achieve with, with, with what I've got around. 
So in answer to the question, there's certain colours that I just haven't really touched upon because I know what they can do and I probably feel I can, I can achieve the same kind of thing um, using other colours anyway, you know. And I, I don't get too worried about colour. It just seems to, it just seems to happen for me. <laughs> I yeah. just seem to be really lucky because half the time I haven't got a clue what I'm doing. <laughs> so I have a question here for you from Niraj. And he says, how much has Van Gogh influenced your decision to do sunflowers? Maybe after you visited Amsterdam. Wow, that's a great question. I mean, I love Van Gogh. I mean, he's one of my, or him and David Hockney are my two all time favorite artists but absolutely zero influence. I mean, I just didn't even think about it because I love Van Gogh, but I love his landscapes. And I love what he used to do when he'd go out into the villages and into the countryside and he'd just immerse himself in the landscape. And he just pushed himself and pushed himself. But his still, his still lives just didn't influence me at all. I mean, not, not in an obvious way. Maybe subjectively they did because I've read a lot of Van Gogh recently. Um, I've got, you know, quite a few kind of, um, biographies and I've, I've, got, I've got lots of like grown-up picture books as well so I've looked at loads of this stuff but it didn't even pop into my head at all yeah yeah mm -hmm. but I, I, think, I can completely get why he would think that though yeah yeah I think uh, the sunflower was actually an excellent choice when we were thinking about doing a flower workshop and you suggested sunflowers I think it's an excellent choice because it's um they have a lot of personality right and they all mm -hmm. look so different from each other mm -hmm. And, and even, you know, there's, you know, they're just so different. Um, they're kind of, there's a kind of a wildness about them. Yeah, I think, I think the choice for the sunflowers was be, because they are such iconic shapes. And Ian, Ian, to the subject. Ian, could you just go back and repeat that last sentence because you froze. Okay, so with my cityscapes, I'm always just looking for shapes. It's shapes that draw me to the subject in the first place. If I go anywhere, like I go to New Orleans or I go to Venice, it's shapes that I'm looking for and it's how I can incorporate those, sh those shapes into the storytelling and into the composition. And it's exactly the same with the sunflowers, yeah. as you just alluded to then, you know, the sunflowers, they tell a story. Yeah. In, in a way that I don't think lilies or roses can, I think the sunflowers are much more kind of in your face. They're almost like caricatures and I like yeah. that. Yeah, like the, they are caricatures of flowers. So, you know, when I'm working with, you know, children, when I'm doing training in school and we do we do flower observation work, we always do sunflowers. Oh, really? Just, as a big, big circle. Well, you start off as a dot and then you turn the dot into a circle and then you populate the outside edge with lots and lots of pe petals and then you do petals in front and you do petals behind and then you put seeds in the middle and you put veins inside the petals. So it's it's kind of like channeling the work that I do with four and five year old children when I'm training their teachers. But it's, it's right. just on a, on a completely different sort of level, you know, perhaps using, you know, slightly more expensive materials. That's yeah. all it is. It's the same thing. It's the same, you know, learning journey. It's the same process. It's creativity. That's what it's all about. That's right. So Eileen says she thinks the sunflowers look like girls to her. And Liz Vargas is saying that in Kansas, the sun, sunflower is the official flower. Wow. Oh, cool. That's yeah. Great. So wow. going back to colors, uh, because we have a few more questions here. Um, oops, admit a new person. Um, somebody's saying that, um, oh, I'm going to ask this question next. Just a minute. Somebody's asking if you could um, list what colors are in your four palettes, um, maybe after the Zoom call. Okay, I mean, I can do it now. Do you want me to do it now? Sure. Let me, let me get the other three. Oh, I'll get the other two. Right. Okay. Now, the thing about, thing about colours, and, and I've mentioned this before, and I've me I mentioned it to everybody who comes on my workshops, is I know exactly what my colours look like, but I don't always know what they're called especially when I'm working on a workshop. So somebody will say to me, what's that? And I'll say it's blue. <laughs> well, what blue is it? I don't know it's blue, but that's what it looks like. Because your mind, when you're working visually, your mind is not always articulating the names of everything. Well, they're so brand I, colors anyway, right? 
Pardon? Like they're often brand colors that somebody, yeah, yeah, exactly. you know. Exactly. Okay, so I'll go through, I'll go through the palette, right? So all my palettes have the same kind of sequence. They all start off with white here and they go all the way around, up and down, and they finish off with black. So there's black and white, white there, black there. And then they go through a range of yellows, reds, deep reds, browns, greens, and then back through blues, back to black. Okay, so this one has got white, lemon yellow, Indian yellow, cadmium red deep, alicia and crimson, cobalt violet, burnt sienna, raw sienna, cobalt turquoise light, sap green, ultramarine cerulean, Prussian blue, and black. So that's just that one palette. That's the palette that I took out with me the other day. And you can see it's all sticky still. It's really sticky. Because what I do before I start painting, I spray water on it and I keep spraying the water on until they're actually drowning and they're soaking and they're all soggy and they're all fed up. But then what it then does, it just activates the paint. It makes them nice and moist. So when you dip the brush in, you get loads and loads of colors. Now this is the other palette, okay? And again, it's exactly the same direction. It starts off with the white. This has got yellow ochre in. Uh, this one's got um, Windsor green. This has got a cobalt blue. That's got Prussian. That's got um, burnt umber. So it's very similar to the other one, but there's a few extra colors that the other one had that this one hasn't got. And then this one, again, same journey. Start off with white, finish with black. But again, it's just got a different range of colors that the other one didn't have. This has so got you, cerulean, iridium, green, green gold. Oops, so when you're going color. out, Ian, uh, are you bringing all four of these palettes with you or you just no, grab no, one? No, just one. I just grab one. When I, when I go away, so when we were in New Orleans last year, I always had two in my bag and then two in the hotel. Oh, okay. And I changed them around. I just swapped them over. And how and do you know which ones to grab? It's completely arbitrary. So what I do is I just try and keep it interesting for me. So, so for, for example, what one of the workshops that we did was in Oak Alley Plantation, and I knew there was going to be a lot of greenery around there. Yeah. So I just made sure I had a couple of greens in the palette, that's all. Okay. You know, it's very, very arbitrary, because I can, I can almost achieve whatever I want with any of the palettes. But yeah. I sometimes like to have different blues. I don't want to use ultramarine all the time or cerulean all the time. Sometimes it's nice to have a Prussian blue instead of a Windsor blue. Sometimes it's nice to have a, a raw sienna instead of a, a yellow ochre. Sometimes it's nice to have an Elysian crimson instead of a, um, a you know, a, a Windsor violet. You know, so, so I, but I can almost achieve the same effects with all of them, but it just keeps it interesting. It keeps oh. it interesting for me. <laughs> so as, long as, black, as long as I've got black and white, I need to have black and white as well. Yeah. That's really important. So right. to sometimes calm some of the colors down, and, you know, to create a nice kind of, you can create a really warm, sexy grey with black and white and raw sienna or black and white and burnt sienna. And it's just stunning. It's amazing. And it's the, it's the only compromise I'll ever do towards mixing colours to try and match what's actually in front of me on the wall. The yeah. rest of the time I'll just make any old thing up. But it's okay. great. It calms everything down. Yeah. yeah. So, so you're sort of, you're leaving the house and it's like eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a tiger by the top. That's how you decide. I mean, seriously, Brenda, life is too short to get hung up about matching colours with reality. Because <laughs> no, it's reality, true. Reality, That's true. Reality is what you want to make it, isn't it? You know, we're not copying photographs. Well, <laughs> we are sometimes, especially at the moment. But, you know, you go out on location and you're recording a three-dimensional space. You know, the colour changes all the time. The colour is affected by your mood. And it's the, affected by the light. The light, yeah. By the shadows. It's affected by the noise, the energy, the smell. It's affected by your hunger. So colour is constantly changing. So I just invent my own colour on top of what I can see, based on what's in front of me, but also kind of what I'm feeling as well. Yeah. Well, wow. cool. So somebody's asking what black? there's different blacks, right? I, ivory, ivory black. Ivory black, okay. Or is it lamp black? It's either lamp black or ivory black. Let me, let, I'll, I'll have to prize it out. <laughs> we want to know everything about you, Ian. 
No, it's I ivory. I was right first time. It's, it's ivory, ivory black. Okay. But you know what? Seriously, there is absolutely hardly any difference between ivory black and lamp black. Now, the, the, the manufacturers will say there's a huge difference, and some artists will say there's a huge difference. But seriously, the way I paint, you wouldn't tell the difference at all. No. Because I don't really use black by itself. I use black to mix with white to create gray, different types of grays with, you know, with the browns or the blues. So the black's hardly a big part of it anyway, you know. Um, yeah. So, so maybe what you're saying in, in essence is maybe don't get too hung up with the exact colors. Well, I, I mean, I don't, but so, some people do. I mean, and there's some fantastic, you know, artists, urban sketchers and watercolor, watercolorists out there who, who just really do love to pick up on all the different kind of nuances of color that they can observe. And I do to a point, but I get really bored with that very, yeah. very quickly, like right. within about three seconds, and I go off and do something else. Yeah. All right. So let's see if we can get our demo to work. Um, so this is after me sketching the outline. Let's see if I can make so this bigger. This, oh, this is two, probably two, two steps already. So a very, very quick, loose sketch. And then I've gone over it with fine liners. Okay. I'm just going to dive in now and start painting. Yeah. And so the reason you have those two steps is because the Tombow pens are water soluble, but the fine liners yeah. are not. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, this is medium, medium pastry brush. Okay. And I'm just putting the ultramarine blue on a couple of splashes there already just to activate the page. And then this is the burnt sienna going in on top. So it's, it's very much wet on wet yeah. and I'm letting the two colors play. Now I could have mixed this separately on the palace, but it would take me so much longer. It would be so much more boring and it wouldn't give me the whole range of colors that I've already got. So by yeah. mixing on the page, you're just you're achieving so much more so quickly. So that's the first head at the top. So now I'm doing the next one down here just before he completely falls asleep on me. So it's the same thing using the pastry brush, going in with the ultramarine blue. I now I'm just pinging some of the burnt sienna. So I'm letting those two colors play together just to achieve a really dark tone. It's beautiful. It's beautiful to see how these colors will flow into each other and then you get, you know, um, different, uh, uh, what I want, different um, hues are coming from those, the way they just play together. This is happening naturally. Yeah, so I'm using the rigger now, guys. Can you see just to push inside those shapes? So you see, I've just created that triangle, and it pushes it right back. So it makes it makes the petal pop out. So the petals have popped out, and that's about you know looking and observing negative space. So you're actually painting the petals without painting the petals. You're painting the space, the space around it. Right, right. With a rigger now. So you started with your flat brush, your pastry brush, yeah. and now you're in with the rigger. And I can see that you're adding a lot of water as well. So you're going in with a lot of pigment on the brush and then you're going in with just water on the brush and pulling it out. Like yeah, that's, that. that's just, yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly right, Brenda. That's just water. So I'm using the water now just to drag it down. Uh -huh. And it just gives a nice kind of smudgy effect. Yeah. And that's a very, very watery burnt sienna now on that, on that particular petal. And then the same thing I'm pinging up towards the top. So it's starting to link things together. So that watery burnt sienna wash is starting to link around other parts of the picture now, which kind of starts to very slowly connect the three heads of the sunflowers together. Mm -hmm. So they started off very much in isolation and now they're just starting to slowly link. It's great fun. I mean, I re really am just making this up as I go along. Yeah. It, you know, it's, you're so inspirational for people and for me too, Ian, because, you know, we're all taught coloring between the lines, right? From the time you're a little kid. And if you color yeah, yeah. outside of the lines, yeah. it's like, oh, oh my gosh, you know, well, and you it's know what? Just... Honestly, Brenda, that's all I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to color inside the lines. That's all I'm thinking. I just want to stay inside the lines, but I just can't help it. I start, I start off with all good intentions. I'm going to stay inside the lines and it lasts literally two or three seconds and I get bored. Uh, yeah. But it's just, um, 
there's so much more life when you're not staying exactly inside the lines. You see, the lines are important because the lines are a guide, but the lines have their own life. And then the painting has its own life as well. So you've got these two elements which are kind of moving together side by side. And sometimes they connect and sometimes they don't connect. And it's important that they both have their own life. So if you look, if you look at the left hand side, you can see those, those four burnt sienna petals pretty much inside the initial lines. But then in other parts have gone completely off. Yeah. So it's important to, to do to do both of them, you know, to do the two. Oh, here we go, guys. Here's the yellow. Is this the yellow coming on now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is the Indian yellow. Yeah. So it's the Indian yellows going on top of the burnt sienna. So it's coming out as a very kind of rich, warm brown. Right. So somebody is asking, Eileen's asking, is the rigor synthetic? And do you have do you know the brand? Yeah, it is, and it is it's pro pro arty. It's a the, the pro arty um the pro, pro arty acrylic riggers, um, and the one I've, I've the one I'm using mainly at the moment is a zero, but I've also got a a three as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so they're they're acrylic these ones, and I use acrylic ones because the heads tend to be longer, and they're more they're, and they're tougher as well. Yeah. And the way I paint, I mean, I really do kind of, you know, knock things around a little bit. I'm quite I'm quite brutal in some ways. When I use the rigger, I, I use the rigger almost like you would a pen. Mm -hmm. So it's getting pushed around quite a lot. And the fact that they're acrylic ones, they just seem to be able to, to cope a little bit more. Yeah. The watercolor so, ones are very kind of soft and more kind of pliable. And that they just don't seem to hold as much paint. Yeah. So this might seem like a really dumb question, but um, when you're flicking and getting these splashes, are you preferring a certain, uh, like a paintbrush or rigger over your flat? Or where are you? Does it matter to you or? No, you can, you can flick with any, you, you, you can flick with any, but it depends on how much paint and water you've got on your brush. You just kind of have to know how much is on there. So, you know, you wouldn't flick right at the beginning. So when I first dived in with the ultramarine blue, there was way, 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 way too much paint on that brush to do a flick. Yeah. It just would have, it would have gone everywhere. And all you'd see now is just a big splash. So you have to be mindful of, of exactly how much paint and water you have on your brush when you're doing the flicking. And, and, and the flicking the flicking's great because it, it just activates the page, it gives it energy, it gives it that man-made, well, sorry, handmade quality, I beg your pardon. Um, and it, it, just, it just animates everything. Um, yeah, do you know, Ian, there's a lot of joy in your painting and you as a person have a lot of joy. You're always laughing and, you know, having fun, and, and you've said to me many times, right, it's all about having fun. And you know, I think there's a metaphor here for painting in the lines or not painting in the lines, because, you know, in life, if you're just going by the book, by the rules of absolutely everything that you do, and you're always worried, what would people think? And, and you know, you're just living inside the lines. There's not a lot of joy there, is there? No, no, you're absolutely right. So I'm, I'm using the round-headed one now, guys. Can you see? And I don't often use this. I very rarely use this on location when I'm doing cityscapes. But the round-headed one was just it was perfect for just describing those kind of inner petals. Can you see? I'm, and I'm, it's quite a deliberate mark that I'm putting on at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. And so they're not dry yet. And so we don't even really know what this is going to look like ultimately until it dries because the paint can still move around quite a bit, can't it? Yeah, yeah, it can. And this is a much heavier weight as well. This is a 600 gram paper. So oh. this is double the weight that I normally use on location um, because this is a sheet of paper rather than it being a, in a sketchbook. This is a sheet. So obviously the sheets, you can, you, you can buy them a lot thicker, a lot heavier. So this, this, I didn't even need to stretch this either. So oh, it's cool. a much heavier ways. Yeah, cool. So I think that's the end of this um, this demo here. All that work that you did, the, the yeah. black and white and the gray, and you did several watercolor sketches with the sunflowers yeah. facing this way, and then they faced this way, and then they were, yeah. you know, um, all of that work was so that you could create a new online workshop that's coming up next week. Yeah. called Urban Sketching Sunflower Edition. Can you tell, yeah. tell us a little bit more about that upcoming workshop? Oh, okay, so, so that, that, was filmed, that was filmed in the studio and in the workshop there's, there's two, there's two um, demonstrations. The first one is a, is a black and white demonstration 
where I've just used the brush pens and fine liners. But again, that's broken down into three steps. So you'll see me sketch out the outline, they go, then go in with the tone work and then do the detail. And then I do it all over again, um, a bit like what we've just seen, but that, that's just one, one clip, one tiny clip of, of a much, much longer um, workshop where I start off again right from the beginning, sketching out the big shapes, going in with the medium detail, putting the colour on, putting the tone on, and then spending ages just really, really exploring and really noticing and, and really looking. And it's, it's very different from stuff I've done before, because as I mentioned at the beginning, everything's so close to you. You know, you can really analyse what's going on. You can just lose yourself in it and you can move them around. And I do move them around a little bit to get a better view of some of the heads. And I do pull some of the petals off as well. And, and they seem to be like, as I'm, as I'm doing it, they, 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 their personalities, their character seems to be coming out. You know, you notice more about them. And I think that's probably why subconsciously I chose sunflowers in the first place, because they just, they are like caricatures of, of flowers. And they're just, they're just great for, for, for I think, for breaking it down and to, and to demonstrating how you can go about recording it in lots of different stages. So it was great, great fun to do. It really was. It was just... It was fab because I just learned so much myself, you know, from doing it. I mean, every time I do something, I learn, I take something away myself, which which is a real privilege to be able to, you know, to do that. Yeah. So that workshop is coming out next week. It's in post-production editing right now. And we're really excited about it. And you'll find it at www.studio66boutique.com. That's exciting. And we can probably hint a little bit about um your new venture as an author oh okay okay yeah 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 do you, before, before we do that has anybody got any questions or is everyone just gone is it just you and me oh talking? no no <laughs> you got a lot of people on this call um i think everybody is uh, i think there's quite a lot of people who are that are taking notes and they're like oh what was the yellow that he said oh but th this is being recorded though isn't it it is. Yeah. Do you want me to do? Would you would you like a live painting demo now? Yeah. On this. Sure. And I'll I'll just use those two colours, burnt sienna and ultramarine. Okay. And I, and I can just I can explain my my technique as well because I think a lot a lot of people when they're painting they do they do use the trays. So for example, they'll use these trays here, and I use yeah. these trays. I use these trays really when I'm using black and white. So when I mix them with black and my white, so I want to ping some brown or yellow or whatever it might be in, I'll, mix, I'll use the trays there. Or if I want to get a certain consistency, you know, if I want to mix, say, an ultramarine blue with a certain amount of water, I'll mix it in here so I can kind of visualise how it's going to go onto the page. But when I'm doing most of my mixing, it happens on the paper. So if I can just show you, I'll just stand up. So I put the ultramarine on, and this is really, really thick. Can you see that, guys? Can you see that okay? Yeah, yeah, we can. And if I wanted to mix some brown in with this now, I put the two together, and they just play. So you're, when you say brown, you mean burnt sienna, right? Burnt sienna, yeah, they just play together so nicely. Now, already, I've got one, two, three. I've got three ranges yeah. on there. And then you can just use your pastry brush and you can just literally push it around, push it around with water. And it just gives you so much flexibility to actually achieve the effects that you want by mixing on the page. Now, not everybody is comfortable with doing that, but it's something that I've developed over the years. And I think one of the main reasons is it's to do with speed as well. You know, when you're visualising what's in front of you, what your subject is, and you want to record it on the paper, it's easier for me to kind of take that observation and put it down and add a little bit of subjectivity, a bit of heart to it as well, a bit of drama, a bit of energy, all that kind of creative stuff that goes on. It's so much more natural for me to do it when I'm mixing the colours on the paper. I mean, if I was much more, say, analytical artist and I was right. really analyzing the light and the shade of the light as, as it fell on the side of the building and, and I was really interested in all the different 
nuances of tone within the sandstone building, then I would do all my mixing probably here and I'd match it. But I can't do that. I just haven't got the patience for that. It mm -hmm. just doesn't fit in with my my way of working. It doesn't fit in with my, my way of seeing either. No. Because I'm, I'm, not, I'm not just seeing colour. I mean, I'm seeing colour, but I'm seeing everything else as well. You know, I'm seeing the shape, the pattern, but I'm also seeing how the whole thing tells a story on the page. And that's, I suppose, the driving point for me. So everything I do, especially the colour, has to fit in with that. You know, the yeah. colour's just one little part of all the other things that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's someone my excuse has... no patience. <laughs> Well, I think when you do that as well, especially if you're feeling a big shape, then you've got a big solid shape in one solid color, which is far mm. less interesting than seeing other colors mixing and mingling in those big shapes. Mm. It's just yeah. I'm not so flat. Um, yeah. So Suzanne is asking what kind of paper is it, Fabriano? I know that's your favorite. Yeah, so I, I use Fabriano hot press. Um, it's a 140 pound weight or 300 grams. And it's it's a three spiral bound, right? Um, and it's 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 a super it's a, like a super white as well. It's it's really it's a white white, like a kind of cold white. Mm -hmm. um, I I tend to use that mostly. I also use SMLT art paper, um, and that's a kind of that's a cold press. It's got a slightly textured surface, and that that paper is really good as well. That's great, great for painting on, but. Because it's a cold press and it's slightly textured, it's not great, you know, for your drawing, for your pen work, because it kind of wrecks your pens, because your pens are going up and down all the little mountains all the time on the surface, so they don't yeah. last forever. Yeah. Yeah, but mainly, mainly Fabriano, yeah. Okay, and Rick is saying, uh, do you pre-wet your paper with a spray bottle or a brush? No, I, I don't, um, but what I do do, which is pretty cool, is when I when I spray, when I spray my when I spray my paints, I always put my paints on top of my paper, you know, my sketch. Yeah. So sometimes some of the water, you see the little hole there where you hold it? Yeah. So sometimes the water goes through there. So I always have like one little egg-shaped part of my picture which is soaking wet. And then little bits kind of spray around the outside as well. So I don't kind of do it on purpose, but I do it does happen when I'm spraying because I put my my palette on top of my page and that's quite nice i, I like that because it's quite accidental <laughs> i think you're you you really enjoy the happy accident mm. you, 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 it can't it really can't be helped because most of the time when i'm drawing i've got people around me either watching or filming or you know, being 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 taught so there's so much going on that you just have to let a lot of things go yeah. You, you just have to, you know, you just, you, you don't worry about an awful lot of things because they're part of the process of being out there, making art on location, you know, and if we did worry about all of these things, we'd probably just spend all our life in our studio and never go outside. But That's as soon great. as you step out your front door, you know, the world is your studio and it's going to throw all sorts of stuff at you, you know, happy accidents, you know, drunks coming up to you, you know, people coming up and I mean, one lady came up to me not so long ago and actually sat on my knee. I'm drawing. She came and sat on my knee. I mean, I did know her, but I didn't know her that well. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Um, okay. Oh, so Jan is saying that she has trouble finding the Fabriano pad, pad that you use in North America. You order online, don't you? Yeah, there's a place called there's Jackson's Jackson's online. You go on Jackson's website, they they sell it, and I'm sure they do shipping to America. Yeah, so Jack Jackson's online. They 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 definitely they definitely sell them. But you could try the Fabriano shop as well, the Fabriano online shop. I'm sure they they they'll do them. But I'm sure there's other hot press paper out there, A3 paper that you can you can get. Um, I mean, the thing about the Fabriano hot press is it's not the easiest to paint on. It is quite tricky. It's not very absorbent, but I like that because it just means the colours sit better on the page. I don't really like it to soak in. They have and more also, time. If they're, yeah, if they're just, floating on the surface for a long time, then they have more time to kind of intermingle, don't they? Yeah, and it gives a, it gives a nice kind of mottled effect as well at times. Well, it depends on the, on the colour as well. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I like it, but it's not the easiest to, to use. 
yeah it really is and sometimes you know i put loads and loads of water on and it takes like about a week for it to dry which when you're doing a demonstration is not the best thing for the students you know to all be sitting around watching paint dry <laughs> and we spent all this money, they've come all this way, and they're so excited to come on one of my workshops in the first two hours. We're just looking at my paint drying. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I use white, because white speeds it up. Yeah, yeah. Because white almost like soaks up some of the water. Really? Is, is, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, it does. It does, because you, if you're using white paint to, to achieve a kind of a very pale colour, you know, you can you can you can you can use you can use white paint, and it's it's going to enable it to dry quicker. Or you can do the same sort of thing and not use white paint, and just use water, and you've got more water, so it's going to dry a lot slower. Yeah. So I sometimes use white as a way of speeding the process up, right. especially when you're outside. You know, yeah. on a workshop with 15 students around waiting, you know, for my picture to, to dry. <laughs> you know, what happens then. So white, um, white's good. White, white is underestimated. And another reason I use white is because one of my tutors at college said to me, never use white watercolour paint. So that's why I use it. And that's why I use black as well. That's why I mix on the paper. Yes, yeah. Well, I know that there's a, there's a big deal about not using black uh, all the time because the Impressionist in the later uh, era of Impressionism didn't use black. They did at the beginning. Van Gogh mm -hmm. used it at the beginning. But um, so if the Impressionist didn't use it, we shouldn't use it, but, but, you know, that's, mad. that's, that's just ridiculous. Crazy. I know. It's yeah. Era. It's just I mental. Isn't it? <laughs> I, I just, I, just, I, I, I don't have any rules at all. I don't have any rules apart from, you know, just try your best and think really hard about what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, take your time and really look, but I think in terms of materials and, and what you should use and what you shouldn't use, I, I really struggle with it because I think, you know, you should give yourself every opportunity to create the image that you want to create and make yourself feel as good as possible while you're doing it. Yeah. So black is going to achieve that for you. Yeah. So a quick question here from uh, Louisa is it. asking. What? <laughs> okay, he's asking what kind of background uh, might you paint for the sunflower and how would you paint it? Well, in the finished picture there is yeah. a little bit of background going on can i can i can i go and get it now and hold it up yeah 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 sure okay don't don't go away guys i'll go and get it okay so while you're gone while you're gone, just to talk for a second um if you just found out about this uh live stream interview that you're watching right now with ian finelli if you just found out about that recently that's because you are maybe not signed up for the Studio 56 newsletter. So I'd like to encourage you to subscribe to the newsletter. To do that, all you have to do is go to www.studio56boutique.com and there'll be a pop-up there within five seconds. And you just fill out that form and then you'll be on our newsletter mailing list, which we don't bug you a lot. We try to get it out once a month. It's really hard for me to even get it out. Um, but please do sign up for the, the newsletter and then you have to add Studio 56 um, uh, email to your contact list because otherwise it could end up in your uh, spam folder. So yeah, sign up for our newsletter and also subscribe. Click the subscribe button uh, on YouTube if you're watching this later on YouTube. <clears throat> Please subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. All right, Ian. Was it Lisa? Did Lisa ask that question? Lisa? Louisa, Louisa. Louisa, Louisa, right, so this is the finished picture, okay? So as you can see, I've completely ruined it from what you saw before, okay? It was completely painful <laughs> afterwards. But if you look closely, you can see I've painted a little bit of blue behind some of the petals. So just like a little suggestion of background. Right. And what, what, what that does, it, it does, it does a few things. One is it, it softens, it softens the white behind and helps the, the flower integrates itself in with the background. So you, you're connecting it together. So for example, some of the blue tones that you can see in the background also match up with some of the blue tones that you're seeing on the actual image itself. So the background and the actual content of what you're doing are connecting together. And it also makes some of the petals pop. It makes them ping forward. So for example, down here at the bottom where there's a little bit of blue, it just makes the petal come forward. So 
just making a little suggestion of the background, you know, has lots of positive effects upon, upon what you're doing. But I mean, I wouldn't like, if there was like wallpaper behind, I wouldn't like copy the pattern on the wallpaper, because that would just be silly. Yeah. That would just detract completely from, from what it is you, you know, you're focusing on. So it's got to be something quite subtle. So things like little subtle suggestions of blue or brown behind work, work really, really well just to soften, soften things. Cool. Yeah. So um, we uh, are in the process of publishing our first book at Studio 56 Boutique, and it's very exciting, and we don't have a date for that yet. We're still in the early stages. And so Ian is going to be publishing his first book, and it's very exciting, and that's all we can tell you. So some people have said, what? There's a book. Tell us more. Well, we really can't say much more. About it. Should we talk a little bit about it? Yeah, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Well, as Brenda said, everyone, it's in its very early stages. We've kind of got all the images because it's all the work that I've been doing over the last, say, three or four or five years. All the images are going to be based on observations. They're all going to be urban sketches. Um, but the, the idea of it is, it's, it's kind of like talking about what I do and why I do what I do and the, the elements that I, I go through, the process I go through, and also the things that I go looking for in my, in my cityscapes. And what it is that really motivates me to do what I do. And we're going to divide it into lots of different sections. There'll be a part which is all about the use of white space, you know, a part, a part on, on it which will be to do with perspective. Uh, there'll be a section where I'm focusing on maybe figures. But there's an also there's a, an, a, another part which I think is probably the most significant, and it's, it's the idea of going from objective to subjective. Because I start off with my, my drawings as an urban sketcher. I kind of get bored after a while and I start kind of defaulting to being an artist, which is, which is my background. I mean, I've always been an artist. So the, the idea is that you start off objectively, you start recording what is around you. And anybody who's been on one of my workshops or seen any of my stuff, you'll see this happens every single time. I start off drawing what's in front of me and then I kind of get sidetracked and I start making art based on what I see in front of me. So I'm going from the objective to the subjective. So in the book, that will kind of permeate throughout the whole thing where you see, you know, Venice was my starting point. New Orleans was my starting point. But the finishing point is me. It's what I want to say. It's what I want to record. It's what I want to reveal. And all the things that we've talked about today to do with colour is very much about that. You know, it's having control of what's in front of you, being in complete charge of all the tools that you bring to bear in the creative process. So that's kind of what the book's about. It's, it's basically trying to describe why I do what I do. Um, and it's going to be great fun. It's going yeah. to be really good fun. That's right. It's really and it's also going to include some links in the book where that you won't have access to unless you buy the book. And you'll be able to go to a link in the book and you'll see him doing an actual demo of the thing that he's talking about in the book, which is going to be really mm. exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Super. Yeah. So hopefully we'll have it, we, we might have it out for, I don't know, I don't know when, but before Christmas? Yes. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Before yeah. Before Christmas. Yeah. So yeah. And it just, it'll be just fit in everyone's Christmas stocking. All right. Well. <laughs> It's going to be, be a pretty. Big stocking, everyone, have to be a massive stocking, but you can, you can, you can ask Santa. Santa, Santa will bring it. Okay. Everyone ask Santa for it. That's right. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, thank you so much, Ian, um, for uh, chatting with me today. I just want to, I just want to tell people about the upcoming interviews that I have. I'm really excited to tell you that on July 20th, I'm going to be talking with renowned news illustrator. Uh, Richard Johnson and Richard uh, is uh, has uh, been published in the um, Washington Post, the National Post, um, the uh, Globe and Mail, and uh, he's been um, embedded um, with uh, with um, the Marine Corps in 2003 uh, during the Iraq War, and in 2007 he was embedded with the Canadian uh, International Security Assistance Force in Kandahar, and he returned several times. And he traveled as a photographer and videographer to Zimbabwe when he was working with the United Nations. And he does beautiful black and white sketches um, right there on the spot, you know, bullets flying all around him. 
of the soldiers. And he and did really very, very important work, I think, um, to help to explain to people, to describe to people what was going on during those wars. And so he's going to be chatting with me on July 20th, and we're really looking forward to that. On July 30th, I'm going to be chatting with Virginia Hine. Virginia has worked as a concept and character designer for toys and for entertainment. She's an urban sketcher, she's an art director, an illustrator, a fine artist, and uh, an instructor and a teacher. And she's going to be talking to us about the dance between line and color. And so that's really exciting. And in August, I'll be talking to Stephen Reddy. Stephen uh, teaches drawing and illustration uh, at the Gage Academy in Seattle. He's the author of Everyday Sketching and Drawing and uh, three other books. And he has a, a new book that's going to be released next week. So that'll be really exciting to talk to him. And then also in August, I'm going to be talking to Hazel Stone. And Hazel uh, is the author of quite a few books. I'm, I like 15 books, something like that. She's a very talented uh, watercolorist and she's also proficient in other uh, kinds of uh, uh, mediums as well. And so I'm going to be talking to her in August um, about her work. So thank you so much, Ian, for You're chatting welcome. with me today. You're very welcome. Let me, see if, let me see if I can get you back. Okay. There is, everyone, is. is everyone still there or have you all gone? No, there's quite a few still there, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ian, for chatting with me. And you're so Thank generous you. and so kind to share all of your things. And people, please uh, check out next week. We're going to be launching, a, launching our new online workshop with Ian, the, the Urban Sketcher Sunflower Edition. Ian, do you have any closing words for people? No. <laughs> I can't think of anything. Has anybody got any questions for me? Does anybody want to ask me any more, more, one, one final question? Nothing, one nothing, final... nothing too tricky, nothing too complicated. Um, people say they're looking forward to the book and, the, and this idea of from objective to subjective is very intriguing. Mm. Mm. Uh, Rick says, thank you, it's such a pleasure. Um, Suzanne says, thank you. Oh my goodness, I don't know if I have questions now. I have. Uh, I have only thank yous at this oh. time. Well, can I, can I just thank everybody for joining us and yeah. just say, everybody, look after yourselves. Okay, take care, keep safe, keep well out there. All right. Super. Thank you, Ian. Take care. Thanks, Brenda. You're welcome. All right. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.